Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. Hey, John, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Welcome to episode 203, season two, episode three. Episode 203, eps- I can't. I, chapter I'm a- three, chapter three. Yeah, chapter three. That's the important thing. It's all lining up. Yes, yes. I, I've tried to make it easier for you uh, this season. Uh, apparently, I've failed. <laughs> <laughs> it really, sh- it shouldn't be me about me, but thank God it is. That's what Well, who else can it be about if not you? Anyway, yes, the, we, this is episode 203. We'll be listening to chapter three of The Bullet Catch. And speaking of The Bullet Catch, the second book in the Eli Mark series, um, there are two threads in The Bullet Catch to murder things that are going on. And one of them is about a movie being made by uh, a friend of Eli's who's in it. Uh, and it's about a sort of a shady figure in the magic community <laughs> called the Cloaked Conjurer, who is uh, who died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. That character uh, is not so cleverly based on an actual person, the masked magician, who had a bunch of specials, uh, which aired in the late 1990s and which caused quite a stir in the magic community. Although, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, Jim, uh, nary a flutter with you. Yeah, well, I was aware of it because uh, I subscribed to both Genie and Magic Magazine. So, you know, I was aware that it was happening, but I was doing a show at that time, uh, six nights a week. And so I have not seen certainly in real time, I didn't see any of it. And I don't believe I have seen a YouTube or any kind of rebroadcast of it in any form. So I, I, while I know, you know, in general terms, what was going on, I don't, I I have no uh, uh, firsthand observation of any of it. Well, I would refer you to the show notes where I've got a bunch of links there for clips you can watch, but uh, even better is we can talk to someone who did have I don't know if he'd say firsthand experience, but who was certainly on the periphery of what's going on because he was running, uh, uh, he was editing uh, Magic Magazine at the time, uh, Stan Allen, uh, magician and publisher. He uh, knew of the show before it started because as he will tell us, uh, he ran a magazine that ran news. And so anything in the magic community that was quote unquote news, he tended to hear about pretty quickly. And he had, uh, he felt a pretty good idea of um who the masked magician was, and he confronted uh, Val Valentino on that. Uh, and it makes for a pretty interesting recap, particularly since Stan Allen is a, uh, a good storyteller and a very, very funny man. So we were very lucky to chat with him. He uh, was... He sent us some background material, so we were able to get up to speed. He sent us some of the articles ahead of time, which was great. And then we sat down, and um, he told us what happened. And the first thing he did was sort of set the stage for us. For the uninitiated, and Jim is one of them, because he was working every night in a show when The Masked Magician came on. For the uninitiated, what was that program? The... uh... What was it called? Breaking the Code or something like that. It was called Breaking the Magician's Code, Magic's Biggest Secrets Finally Revealed. (laughs) It rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? No question. Well, we first started hearing rumor about it uh, March, April, May of 1997, but it was, oddly enough, and the irony is not lost here, it was kept very tight-lipped over at uh, the television network. And then the first one popped up, I guess, late November 1997. And it was a one hour show that was based on we're going to tell you how all the magicians do their secrets. And it attracted over 24 million viewers who not only tuned in, they stayed tuned in throughout the show. And that first effect gave away things like Girl to Tiger, Shadow Box, Levitating a Woman, Zigzag Girl, Metamorphosis, Sawing. And just because everybody wants to be able to do, they added the vanishing elephant because we all have that in our repertoire. It's, I'm so sick and tired of seeing magicians vanishing elephants. I have to feed mine before this podcast is over. So if I step away, it's because I'm feeding the elephant. I understand. I have to bathe mine, which you know how difficult that is. (laughs) Really very, very bad. So you knew just, I mean, you were hearing rumors about it? Yeah, the thing about being in the, what I learned through Magic Magazine is that if you publish news every month on time, people give you more and more news. 
Now, some of it's credible, some of it isn't credible. And we had a source that not only told us it was coming, they told us what it was gonna be and they told us who the person was, but we could not get second source on any of that. And so we did not run it. We just ran a news blurb that rumors have it, this is coming out and we did not list the, the magician's name, Valentino, Val. And then the first special aired and pretty much about that point, everything hit the fan. And so what was the reaction? Well, the reaction was, uh, what's a good word for hate? Uh, <laughs> I guess that works. That works. That's a good you know, word. You're, you're the writer. I used to be an editor. Is it villatile? Vil, vil, what's... I would never use a word that large. Okay, got it. No, no word okay. I okay. Yeah, this is why we had Max Maven writing for us. We <laughs> had the big words. You know, we just... He knows all the words. He, he did know all the words. Quick aside story, though. Yeah. yeah. I got a phone call late night one night. We had sent the, uh, the magazine into print. And in those days, they, they pulled out film and then they made plates from the film. And there was a guy who worked all through the night pulling film out for all these magazines at this company. And this guy was very slow speaking and his name was Notley. And I had only talked to him once. I'd met him one time. He calls me at home and said that he was reading Parallax column, Max Maven's column, and Max had said that he could write with small words and that he had actually used no less than six syllables, six letters in any word in this column. And it was a great column because he was being taken to task for using big words. And Notley in his slow fashion just said, but he's got a seven letter word Ooh. in here. <laughs> and I, he said, I am so sorry to bother you. I said, are you kidding? You just made my day, my week. I get to call Max Maven and say, you moron. <laughs> And uh, I just loved that. It was great. And then I asked him, I said, wait a minute. A, how did you catch it? What were you doing reading it? And he says, oh, no, Parallax is one of them. I read these things, okay, uh, one or two articles a night. But Parallax is one of my favorite. I love him. That's so, great. You know, I wouldn't have, people talk slow and we don't think they're as smart. No, no, he was right there. But uh, I love that. No, you know, there's a seven letter word. In there. Oh, that must have felt so good. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. You said that the, the identity of the mass magician was kind of an open secret, was never really in doubt. In fact, I think you said that you even called Val the next day after the show aired, right? But he didn't own up to it? Right. I don't think I called him immediately. There was, we finally got a second source, a makeup person. And also we could see the physical size of him and everything. And I knew Val, we worked in we didn't work in the same comedy clubs, but we worked at the castle together once or twice. And we worked the same clubs and we knew him. Very nice man. A little bit more outside the magic circle. He wasn't part of the, uh, didn't go to a convention unless he was booked and didn't really want to work with magicians that much. But anyway, he was sort of over here on his own, but a very nice man. And I think everybody liked him and well respected. And uh, after the first special aired, um, we were ready to say who it was. And I called up Val and actually hard copy called me and wanted to send a crew to my office and promise to give the magazine eight seconds on national television to cover, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to think long and hard about it and uh, just decided that no, my step in all of this was going to be do not publicly fight it. So I can't come out and appear on hard copy. So I called Val up and said, hard copy is going to get you. And he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, Val, are you the mass magician? They're saying you're the mass magician. Well, why would they say that? Hmm, I don't know. Let's start with, are you the mass <laughs> magician? And he answered with things like me. Why me? How bizarre. And, you know, I had three kids. I was a kid once. I knew desperately not to lie, but how could I just not really tell the truth? There was a difference between lying and telling the truth. My parents didn't see that difference, but I thought there was a, a, a hard line there. Anyway, he would not answer. And he finally said, well, I'm, I'm going to have to talk to my attorney is whether what should I say? I said, really? I would think that if it wasn't you, the answer would be no. And he would not give me that answer. And then the, the callback was, I can't talk to you. And 
the production company, which by the way, was not named on the first special. The producer or the production company wasn't named. Bruce Nash, who went on to do wonderful things about people who cheat on their spouse, volume two, you know, and things like that, uh, first class stuff. But he didn't want his name attached to it. And I loved it. I always thought the irony of all of this and to jump ahead, Mitch, again, how do you pronounce his last name? Pelagi? Yes, I believe that's how you say it. Let's just call him Mitch. Let's call him Mitch. Well, I granted he was an actor doing it, but the way this was written was so disrespectful to magic. And yet he was on X-Files and not long afterwards, a big secret script got out on X-Files and all the X-Files people, including Mitch, went online and... Uh, I'm not sure it was online in those days, but spoke out about who would do this, who would ruin the, the secret and the surprise and the wonder. And we're all over here looking around going, I'm sorry, what'd you say? So the irony of all of that. So anyway, shortly days afterwards, it was pretty much nailed. We received a faxed letter from the production offices from the mass magician explaining why he did it, how he did it, how he saved us by not making it two hours and by not using real secrets, uh, yada, yada, yada. And uh, uh, oh, a year or so later, because there were four specials and the last special aired in November of 1998, so one year later. And we did a, an interview with Val and let him have all of that say. The magic community didn't buy it though. So the reaction was that this is the worst thing that's ever happened. And what are we going to do now? Magicians across the country are, are outraged over this, but are they in some way afraid to respond in the possible scenario that it would elevate the, uh, the conversation and maybe draw more viewers to this program? Or where, what are magicians doing? Well, they were all over the board. And I wished because... We ran a cover story. Uh, we ran a cover story in February, and the headline on the cover was "What Now?" And that was the answer to say, "What do you think we should be doing?" Some people were rushing to go to their news outlets and scream and shout and rant and rave. Other people were working on getting lawsuits, raising money, and let's sue us. But and uh, then there was a, a group over here that was kind of saying. Uh, guys, I don't think we should give them any publicity. I think the best thing we can do is dismiss this. And when somebody asks you at a party, oh my God, did you see that mass magician? I mean, come on, come on. You're, oh, <laughs> yeah. He really dug into the books and found old, old things that nobody does anymore. Certainly not with a forklift to make a lady float up in the air. Play it down, dismiss it. Don't give it any, uh, don't throw any fuel on that fire. And that was the, the, the crux of the what now was to say, first and foremost, don't give this show any publicity. Don't give it any credit. Discredit it if you can. And there were a number of ways that we suggested could be done, such as reaching out to the networks, but not as magicians, right? As a concerned viewer, a family viewer, I watch your shows, my family, we watch this and it just took all the wonder out of magic shows and we love magic shows. And are you going to keep doing this? Because we're not going to stay with you if you are. Same way with advertisers. One guy, um, Kevin Spencer, wrote 18 of the advertisers. And he got letters back from 12 of those people saying, tell us more and, and talk a little bit about it. Um, so we felt there was behind the scenes. But don't do it as a magician. Because as soon as you do it as a magician, well, you're those crazy magicians. Of course, you know, it's, it's political. All of a sudden, you're a group and you're ranting and raving because you're the ones on the hotspot. You mentioned lawsuits. Didn't Andre Cole sue because of something very specific? Andre Cole was involved in the lawsuit. A group was formed and they raised money to do something legally and they hired a PR firm and a lawyer. Ultimately, there was a court case. Ultimately, it went before a judge and the lawyers for the mass magician walked in with magic books showing Andre Cole's death, a table of death was the, the trick that was really being pushed out there as we could protect this through a trade secret. But you look at the Walter, Walter Jean's biography, there's the trick pretty much already. And they, they just showed a few of those things. And my understanding is it wasn't before a judge very long before it was just thrown out and all that money raised and to what purpose? So what happened to Valentino after yeah. these four specials? Well, 
he had a s small bit of notoriety where the mass magician could appear somewhere. And as I recall, he did some shows as the mass magician and then unveiled himself or started unveiled and then became the mass magician. I'm not sure. So he tried to ride the wave a little bit. He went into other countries as the show started airing in other countries. And uh, but it was it was relatively short lived. I didn't hear from him after the interview or talk to him for. Well, it was about four years ago. I bumped into him at a magic event here and he didn't live here. He was somewhere uh, in the south at the time. And I talked with him briefly. I, again, I liked him. When he did reveal himself in the last special, he had quite a long monologue that he gave beforehand. Do you remember your reaction and the community's reaction to that justification before he unveiled himself? I think the reaction was just that it was justification. And by the way, those kinds of justifications have been used in book publishing and all the way back a hundred years when all the great secrets were published in a book. And the guy said, no, I'm doing this to force magicians to come up with new ideas. Oh, uh, I'll say, well, I, I didn't, I never thought of that before. And so to me, it was just an extension of all of those, get kids interested. You know, we protected the good ideas. The problem in this is to me, and the reason that I disliked this so much had less to do with secrets being revealed and much more to do with disrespect for the art. If you showed, here's how linking rings are done. And then you say, okay, now you know how the trick's done. Now watch this magician, watch Richard Ross perform this ring routine. And yes, he's using this technique. Wow. Now that's showing some respect, but it wasn't. They accented the secrets, which is down the list of importance in magic for any serious magician. And they emphasize the cheesy presentation, which the magic community is somewhat guilty of. We fed them that, so own up, you know. Um, but they could have respected the arts. And uh, that's what I disliked the worst about it. And uh, I think it was Teller who said the problem with the mass magician was that it didn't go too far. It didn't go far enough. Because if you had given away the secret, if you just say, yeah, there's the secret, nobody cares. But if you showed how it was developed, if you showed all the work, if you showed the cleverness of it, the angle is so perfect. This, I mean, when you get into all of that, now we become closer to an art. There's more to it than just, oh, there's, I'm holding the coin over in this hand, you idiot, you know, and that's, uh, that's the shame of it. Also, the other thing that magic is, you know, people are curious about it. Of course, they're curious. We have some, I guess, established curiosities. People love gamblers, cheats, you know, that you just go, oh, um, the mafia for a while or the Vatican behind the scenes. You know, there's just certain things that you love to pull the veil back on. And, uh, you know, the Da Vinci Code and other things, they, they've kind of pulled the, the veil back on some of this stuff. It's fun. We like it. Magic's one of those things. There's no question about it. You paint your van, such and such magic show, it might get broken into. Not to steal things, Curiosity, malicious, you know, it's not really malicious. But secrets are such a small part of our art. And I use the example of who shot JR? I don't remember. Okay. But you remember the campaign mm -hmm. for a summer in 1980. Everybody was talking about who shot JR. Whoever came up with that, genius, mm -hmm. absolute genius. And when the show finally aired, they got a 76% share with estimated 83 million people. That's more people that voted in the presidential election of 1980. Mm -hmm. So the world remembers it. And they remember that happening. And I asked people at a Magic Live one time, raise your hands if you remember the phrase, who shot JR? Almost the entire audience, certainly those of age. How many people remember who actually shot JR? 10%? 15%? I have no idea. I don't. And I think the answer there is, as soon as we found out who shot it, well, we're not, that's, our curiosity is gone now. So we don't yep. remember it. So when magicians freak out about secrets, they're not going to remember. Don't add the fuel to it. Don't do anything like that. And so, but back to that, the reason I dislike the show so much because of the disrespect it showed to the magic world. Impact on the magic world. Gee, I mean, there's been exposures on exposures, exposures. The largest of all time probably was the Camel Cigarette ads of 1933. 
It was huge, 1,200 newspapers and magazines, big single page or double page spreads of it's fun to be fooled, but more fun to know. And uh, 38 fairly popular effects were exposed. And that was a huge thing for about eight months. Um, and then the, the magic community moves on. At the time of the mass magician, we received information from people that said, I'm out of the business. I can't get booked. Nobody's going to book. I'm sorry, if the mass magician put you out of business, you were a little too close to being out of business already. <laughs> yeah. you know, if all of your stock is in your secret, if all you present out there is, I'm going to fool you with this trick. Well, that's a bad investment. And it's not a question of if anybody finds out, it's win. you know. Mm. So I don't think it had any lasting effect on magic at all. The thing that I wonder about is, you know, I, I, I belong to, uh, uh, I'm a Freemason. And all of the things that are sort of secret in the Freemason world are available online. You can just look it up. You can read all of it. It's right there. And I have maintained all along, it doesn't really matter because it has nothing to do necessarily with that it's the experience of the guy going through this that matters and I wonder if the same isn't true here that for an audience member even if I know how something is done as you said if somebody's doing it and they're doing it well I still get you know the magic payoff of it don't you think oh I think absolutely so and also we just assume anybody finding out how our trick is done is the enemy. And I tell about, somebody sent me this story. He's doing linking rubber bands for a handful of people around. And there's one guy not paying any attention. He's on his phone. But after he's done doing the trick and the crowd dissipates, the guy comes over and, he's, and he asked, is this what you're doing, what you're using? So how does a person react to that now as a magician? Well, first of all, the guy's not being an ass about it. He didn't stand up in front of everybody and say, hey, look what he's doing. I got this trick. No, he didn't. So he's curious. Well, you know what? We were all curious at one point, and that's what got us into this. So for all you know, that's a potential magician right there. And besides, do you make him an enemy or a friend? So the answer, my thought was, you just look at it and you go, you know, no, I'm not using that, but it's pretty close. How did mine look? Now you're together. And we're talking about that experience that Jim mentioned of, hey, that's a positive experience for that guy. You know, so why jump off on that? You know, why head down that road? And you're right. Art is touching people or people allowing themselves to be touched by a painting, by a movie, by a song or by whatever. And that touching is what makes it art. And in the magic world, we can't touch people. We can tell them stories. We can show them something that boggles their mind and they're joyful at it. I have a line, I mean, I haven't done this trick and I'm not gonna say the line because out of context, it wouldn't make any sense. But it's a, a crazy, ridiculous sketch I'm doing. And there's one line in there that is just, you go, that's over the top funny. And I had a cruise director a year or two later went back and he was a cruise director on the ship and he called me into his office. And I just want to show you this. And above his desk, he'd had a sign made with that line on it. And I said, well, what's this? And he goes, oh, when my day's going crappy, I just look up there. It makes me smile. <laughs> okay. So That's in that crazy. small way with that one person, that was art. That goofiness became art because it touched them and it brought them joy. It might bring them sadness. It might bring them reflection. Whatever it is, the worst thing you want in art is to be dismissed. Mm. If you walk by the, you know, in the gallery, I look at a piece of art and go, oh, uh, yeah, right. And just keep going. That's dismissal. That's a failure. Now, maybe I'm just not the right person for it, but dismissal is failure. And if we invest totally in secrets, uh, we're going to end up bankrupt. Um, but but that's, that's the thing. Nobody cares about the secrets. They're not going to remember the secret, they're gonna remember, what's the old expression? They're gonna remember how you made them feel. That's it, you know? They're gonna remember how you made it feel. I'm, I'm just still curious about Valentino. In reading uh, some of the articles that, uh, that John was so kind to send me in preparation for this, it sounds, if you read between the lines, that 
it, it had, and I don't, I, I'm, I'm not blaming, I'm just saying, it sounds like it had everything to do with money and most things do. So I'm okay with that if the guy, but is his name in the magic fraternity? Cause I, I, I would be willing to bet in the same way that we can't remember who shot JR that the general public may remember the mass magician. But if you said, what was his real name? I think the majority of the general public will go, I, no idea. I don't think no they ever idea. had. Yeah, I don't think they ever had his real name that right. they would have recalled for any reason. Right. Yeah. His but in the magic yeah. fraternity certainly, and I'm not. I don't consider myself a really a card carrying member of the magic fraternity, but I certainly knew his name because you know I read and subscribed to your magazine and Genie, and you know, so I knew it. What do you think, magicians like you and other magicians? How is he viewed? Is he the devil? Is he a footnote? Is he, where is he? Well, it's interesting. About three or four years after this mass magician thing. And so let's see, when was that? 97. So we did our first Magic Live in 2001. And the idea was bringing the pages of the magazine to life. So somewhere around 2004, when we were doing the second one of these, I mentioned to a couple of people, hey, should we bring Valentino back? And talk to him and find out what he's up to and whatever the deal was and maybe give him an opportunity to say, I'm sorry, or whatever. I'm not sure where we would have gone with it. And the pushback I got, nobody thought it was a good idea. Just a handful of people, but one said it really well. The guy was not really in our club, in our group. He was a magician slightly outside. And there have always been people like that, that hey, they're just out there working and doing it. They don't, they love magic either for a job or because they love magic, but they don't love the communal aspect of magic. And for so much of us, if my, if I hadn't made such good friends as a young man, would I have stayed in magic? Probably not. I, I don't think the hook was in me that hard, but the friendship, oh yeah, life plan. And I have friends that are 50, 50 plus years, 55, we're going on 55, 56 years. He was not like that. And when I mentioned it to this one guy, he says, look, he was never really one of us. He might've been one with us, but he was never one of us. We all saw the specials. We all saw the damage that it did. You gave him an opportunity to explain himself in it. Don't bring him back. Don't rub our face in him again. Don't open up that wound again. And uh, I took that advice. So the magic community pretty much just uh, washed their hands of him. And uh, even though the effect of the exposure is long over, I still think people would just shake their head and say, yeah, you, you kind of made your bed. That's it. I, don't, I just don't think he would be uh, welcome back with open arms, even after all these years. Yeah, uh, the people who do remember uh, the masked magician, I don't probably wouldn't welcome him back. Uh, what I thought was interesting, uh, the many interesting things that Stan said, his question about who shot JR, in that we all remember that, yep. we just don't remember the specifics of it. Uh, your comment about uh, that Masonic information is readily available, that secrets aren't really what it's about, and people who worry about the secrets are, are just kind of wasting their time, because people are, are just not going to care. Right? Even, uh, yeah, I think that's true. But, but, but even even if you know how something is done, if you watch somebody who is a master do it, 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 it is still so great. And, and uh, in, if you just let's confine it to magic, it can still absolutely rock your world and fool you if, in the in the hands of somebody who is a master at what they do. I, I knew upwards and backwards and forwards how the linking rings work. I saw Cellini in his living room do it just for me. And I wept. I mean, literally, I wept when it was over. His setup was so great, uh, explaining how he came to magic and the people that had influenced him and uh, and then he played a version of uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow uh, and talked about the girl that recorded this version and she is now passed on. And so this is sort of a tribute to my two great mentors in magic. 
the man who introduced me to it in Slidini, my master, and this woman who sang this song that I find so moving. And then he did it. And even though I knew exactly how it was, you know, it was something I will never forget. I'm getting the, the goosey bumps just talking about it now. So I don't, it, secrets I think are overrated. I really do. I, I, it, it's all about like in the Masonic uh, kind of uh, encapsulating that idea. It, it's not about the information. It's about the experience. And right. if the experience is great, then who cares? Well, yeah. it's like uh, uh, what Stan Allen said, quoting Keller, that it's the the, ma the mass magician just didn't go far enough. Yeah. And and you know, not only do you show us how it's done, but then show us someone doing it beautifully, like the experience you had, and and then that's a really more worthwhile enterprise than just sh showing people how stuff's done. I mean, it would just be like standing on stage before comedians coming up and just reading off all of their punchlines. Like, yes. Oh. Well, yeah, that's not going to yeah. get you very far. Exactly. Yeah, there, there are a topic nonetheless. Yes. And the there's a real sadness in the book. Kind of get your that's book. Your in, book. The, in that in book. Yes, in our book. And I that was, you know, based on the, the reality of this guy kind of ruined his career for this moment of glory and for going after money, which he didn't necessarily have to do. He, you know, he, he went down the wrong path. Like you, there are many, many people who have never seen the Masked Magician perform. Uh, I've got some uh, links in the show notes showing uh, a couple of the things he's done, as well as a link to the hard copy segment that Stan referenced on the Masked Magician when they revealed who they felt he was. There's also a link to the point in the show where he uh, he unmasked himself and gave that speech about wallet, why he did it, uh, which is very similar to the facts that he had sent to Stan Allen. And then finally, there's a real nice takedown uh, a link by Penn Jillette aye, aye, aye. talking about the masked magician. And of all the people in magic, I would not want to take me down. Penn Jillette might be at the top of the list. You know, it's, it's Penn Jillette, So there's a certain amount of um, oomph to what he's saying, but the, yeah. the thought behind it, which is famous people don't put on masks. You don't become famous by wearing a mask and you are not a famous person because you wore a mask. And that he wasn't even talking about the magic. Uh, in in that clip, if you listen to it, he's just talking about the guy thought he was famous, and he said, "You're not famous because famous people don't wear masks." I, I would argue, perhaps the Lone Batman. Ranger might be an exception. Batman, I can think Batman. of Batman right out of the gate. <laughs> okay, I guess I guess Pendulette's wrong. No, and no, no, please <laughs> let's not run afoul of Pendulette. I have so much respect for him, uh, and, and really, uh, you don't want to be on the wrong end of him. But gosh, dang it, whenever I watch. Uh, fool us he is so kind yes. and so great to the people that come on that show that it's in a certain to a certain extent i don't know if you watched any of the years of uh, uh america's got talent it was very popular with my kids in the house here in the in the years that howard stern was one of the judges and i always thought oh my gosh i wouldn't want to be on the wrong end of howard stern and and yet he was so kind to most of those people and really did not kind of rip up one side down the other, which is what I assume would happen. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the same is true of Penn. You wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of that because he is so smart, uh, yeah. but he's, he just has such a big heart, a gentle giant, if you will. Yeah, he's bombastic, but there's thought behind it, yeah. which is, uh, I think, why they've had such a long career. So they're both really, really smart about what they do. Speaking of smart, let's uh, let's oh, go to your book now. I think we can do a better segue than that. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll take that one. So speaking of smart, uh, the bullet catch. We're going to listen to uh, uh, chapter, chapter three. three. That's yeah, right. Nice so follow. let's just quickly recap what's happened in case you okay. forgot. We've met Eli's friend Jake North in disguise. He's playing Terry Alexander, who is the cloaked conjurer who uh, died during. Uh, a mishap while performing the bullet catch. Uh, Eli's agreed to work with Jake on the movie because Jake is afraid he's going to be killed. They've run into Megan and Franny. First time he's seen Megan since the breakup. And uh, Franny uh, had a vision of Eli involving a gun and a man being shot. And as she says that, Jake goes white. And uh, that takes us right into chapter three. <laughs> Bullet Catch, an Eli Marks mystery. Chapter 3 
Terry Alexander was a cad, a bounder, a louse. On his best days, he was a louse. He was so low, he'd get the bends every time he stood up, the rat bastard. I wasn't entirely clear on what that last crack meant, but I was certain I had come to the right place. That place was Adrian's, a bar which has stood next to Chicago Magic as long as Chicago Magic has stood. When I returned to the magic shop after coffee with Jake and found that Uncle Harry wasn't in the store or in his apartment upstairs, I knew it was a pretty good bet he was next door. He spends a good portion of each week swapping stories and insults with a group of aging magicians that officially called themselves the Minneapolis Mystics, although my late Aunt Alice had always referred to them as the Artful Codgers. Their numbers were thinning more than their hair, but they had a fair turnout for today's bull session. I pulled up a chair and didn't interrupt the flow of conversational insults, waiting for an opening to bring up the topic at hand. Sitting across from me was Abe Ackerman, a hypnotist of the Kreskin variety, just never as famous. It might have had something to do with his looks. If Boris Karloff and Abe Vigoda had a love child, he would have grown up to look like Abe Ackerman. On his right was Sam Espiornson, a magician who specialized in coin work. Although one of the oldest in the group, he was still phenomenal, even at this late stage in his life. He had absently picked up two coins off the table and was rolling them up and down the back of his left hand. It was such an ingrained habit, I'm not sure he was even aware he was doing it. And on Abe's left was my Uncle Harry, quietly stroking his gray beard. Up until this point, Harry had been silent on the topic of Terry Alexander. This had not gone unnoticed by Abe. So, Harry's being a bit mum on the topic of this louse, it seems to me, Abe said. I was raised not to speak ill of the dead, Harry said quietly, regardless of what we may have said about them when they were alive. Who's not alive? Did I miss something? The gravelly voice came from behind me, and I turned to see Max Monarch, the best card man in the group. He was struggling to take off his windbreaker as he toddled toward us. I got up and pulled another chair up to the table. Sorry I'm late, Max continued, carefully hanging his windbreaker on the back of the chair. I swear I hit every red light between here and downtown. Every red light. Back in the day, the city had the stoplights timed. You drive 28 miles an hour and you can soar down Portland like nobody's business. But ever since that Fercocta light rail train came in, I swear, every traffic light is marching to the beat of its own drummer. In my entire life, I swear I've spent 30 years sitting at red lights, and that's not an exaggeration. Max settled himself in the chair, looking around for a reaction, but the group had listened to Max complain about red lights for so long, it no longer even warranted a comment. He waved to the waitress with a hand signal for his regular a ginger ale with no ice, and then turned to the group. So, who died, he asked, trying and failing to temper his enthusiasm with an attitude that appeared more somber. Terry Alexander, I said. Yesterday's news, Max snorted, the rat bastard louse. I remember when he exposed my classic envelope switch, Abe grumbled. Couldn't do it for two years. Ruined it. Absolutely ruined the bit. He shook his head in disgust at the memory. Not me, Max countered. When he exposed the dancing queens, I put them back in my act the next night. The next night, he added for emphasis. The dancing queens never left your act, Sam said. Nothing ever left your act. You're thinking of Lance Burton. He's the one who put an illusion back in his act the night after Terry Alexander exposed it. Me... Lance Burton, the point is still the same, Max said, as the waitress brought him his ginger ale. He smiled up at her, and she returned the smile and then headed back to the bar. I'd to be young again, Max sighed. I'd to be sixty again, Abe added. Sixty? Well, I'd take sixty-five, Sam said. My point, Max continued, is that exposure is all in your point of view. When people would say to me, hey, I know how that's done, I saw the cloak conjurer do that trick, I'd always have the same comeback. I'd say, yeah, 
He does it the easy way. Anyone can do that. I do it the hard way. Knowing you, you did it the wrong way, Sam grumbled. Eh, stick in your ear, Max shot back. Uh, stick in your act, Sam retorted. It'll hurt more people that way. Guys, I said, interjecting myself into what looked to become another escalating exchange. I need you to look at something. They say you can find anything on the Internet, and I'm beginning to believe it's true. A relatively short search had produced a grainy, poorly shot video of Terry Alexander performing his most famous and last illusion, the bullet catch. His was the final act in what appeared to be a mangy, flea-encrusted traveling circus that was tottering on its last legs somewhere in the poorly lit outskirts of Ecuador. I held the iPad for the four older magicians as they strained to see the highly pixelated images on the screen. The performance itself appeared perfunctory. Terry Alexander, dressed in his usual black T-shirt and black jeans, selected two volunteers from the audience. The sound recorded by the small camera or camera phone was muffled and completely indecipherable, but since the conversation was likely all in Spanish, it wasn't a big issue. Terry, looking drawn and pale, handed a bullet to one volunteer and a handgun to the other. Each examined their respective item, and then Terry gestured for them to switch and examine each other's article. When this was completed to their satisfaction, Terry handed a marking pen to the first volunteer, who slowly and carefully drew what appeared to be his initials on the bullet. All the while, Terry kept up a continuous and almost droning narration in what sounded like muffled Spanish, apparently explaining each step in the process to the small crowd. The first volunteer handed the signed bullet to the second volunteer, who loaded it into the gun. Terry directed him to a spot toward one side of the dirt patch that was acting as the stage, and then he gestured to a glass window that had been jury-rigged in the center of the impromptu stage. Terry moved past the window, tapping on the glass as he passed it to establish its authenticity before taking his place on the other side of the stage. During all this setup, he continued his oration in a flat monotone, doubtless explaining to the gathered crowd the intended effect. The gun would be aimed at him and fired. The bullet would pass through the window, shattering the glass. In that same instant, Terry would catch the bullet in his mouth. The camera work was shaky and unfocused, but we could see Terry as he centered himself on his mark and began a countdown in Spanish from ten. Soon the audience picked up the countdown as a chant and took over, getting louder and louder as they got closer to the end point. Cuatro. Tres. Dos. Uno. As they hit Uno, the crowd cheered, and we could hear the distant pop of the gun, followed by the dim tinkle of breaking glass. The camera whip-panned across the stage, just in time to see Terry Alexander fly back from an impact and then lay motionless on the ground. The crowd was silent for a split second, and then the silence was shattered by a series of screams, and people began to move. Some moved toward Terry's prone shape on the ground, while others pushed and shoved their way to the exit. I heard cries of, Este muerto! Este muerto! which were followed by more jiggling camera work, chaotic commotion and screaming, and then the video ended as the screen went black and silent. Abe was the first to speak. The bullet catch, he said, shaking his head, was always bad news. Only a crazy person puts that cursed trick in his act, agreed Max. Crazy? Stupid? Take your pick, said Sam. He had been so engrossed in the video he had actually stopped rolling the two coins across the back of his hand. It's the only truly deadly magic trick. I don't know, Abe said, leaning back in his chair and gesturing toward Max. Have you ever seen his twisted aces? I'll twist your aces, Max grumbled. 
course, the answer to the key question with Terry Alexander and the bullet catch, Sam continued, completely ignoring the exchange, is the one we'll never know. Was it an accident or murder? Abe clucked his tongue. The man had made no shortage of enemies in his day. Many a magician would have loved to see him dead. Now, that's what they call the true fact, Sam said. For a while, he was the world's most hated magician. Took the heat off you for a bit, didn't it? Abe said, producing chuckles around the table. But did anyone hate him enough to kill him? I asked. The question received shrugs from around the table. All except Harry, who was leaning back in his chair and quietly stroking his beard. Or could it just have been an accident? You know, a trick gone wrong, I added. I saw at least three spots where the bullet could have been switched out, Abe offered. And I saw two more where it could have been switched back in, Sam countered. There are plenty of opportunities within that trick for things to go wrong, Harry said quietly. At least a dozen magicians have discovered that over the years to their peril. But what I saw there, he said gesturing at the iPad dismissively, was simple ineptitude. A magician who screwed up, plain and simple. Let's look at it again. I ran the video again, and the four men watched it even more intently than the first time. When Terry handed the spectator the bullet, there was a murmur from the group. When he had the two spectators swap their items for inspection, heads began to nod around the table. When one of the spectators loaded the bullet into the gun's chamber, one of the guys made a low whistling sound while another muttered, Right there, and went wrong, right there. They immediately started exchanging comments. Their attention turned away from the screen, not even bothering to watch as Terry was shot and fell. Simple mistake, Max said, sipping his ginger ale. Human error, plain and simple. Ironic justice, if you ask me, Abe added. A man who exposed so many secrets felled by his own ineptitude. But even I have to admit, in his day, he was a solid magician. But not with that trick. Even more ironic, Max added, is the fact that to reveal the secret behind this mystery, you'd have to do exactly what we all hated Terry Alexander for doing. You'd have to tell people how the trick was done, which magicians will never do. Sort of fitting when you think about it. Well, if you ask me, in death, he at least did some good, Sam said definitively. The others turned for clarification, but Sam let them wait while he took a sip of his coffee laced with Bailey's. Any magician who even thinks of doing that trick today will at least think twice now because of the sad fate of Terry Alexander. I turned to Harry to see if he had anything to add, but he simply nodded in agreement with the others. So Eli has spent some time with the Minneapolis mystics. They all have their own point of view about Terry Alexander, most of which was taken from written things and podcast discussions and things I heard people actually, the way magicians actually did respond to the mass magician. Um, some of them getting extremely upset. You know, he's revealing, revealing our secrets. Others going, well, if he, I'm doing the, the trick he just did and revealed. I'm putting that in my act. I'm doing it tonight. He's not going to get in our way. And although you didn't uh, have much interest or concern about it at the time, it was a, even as a non-magician person, I heard all about it at the time and people were very upset about it. So it was fun to put a lot of those words into the mouths of uh, Harry and his friends as they talk about this betrayal of the, the code, the code, uh, the code. which... I believe it was Jim Steinmeier who said, uh, magicians guard an empty safe. Uh, and I think if I'd heard that before I wrote that chapter, that would have worked in there sometime. But anyway, so Eli's going to go ahead and help Jake not get killed while performing the bullet catch for this movie. Right. Um, it is not the only dangerous trick in magic. It's one of the more famous ones. Uh, but next uh, episode, we're going to talk to Joshua J, who has a whole speech that he gives on what he calls tragic magic, uh, which is fascinating. He's just been collecting stories for years about uh, magic gone wrong. And not uh, in a funny way. Not in a funny way. It's, <laughs> uh, it's, I will, uh, it's kind of a grim 
uh, yeah. conversation. So be prepared for that. Good stuff. Good, good stuff. You know what you ought to do? You ought to if subscribe to this podcast. That's what you ought to do, folks. If you, you know, I should, I should do that. That would be interesting. I should do that. Now actually, that you, you are the one who should do it. I do subscribe because I have to make sure that it comes out. But, but you've already heard it. Why would you want to listen to it again? There's nothing well, I new. Enjoy, I enjoy the, 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 the thing about it is even, you know, when we do these interviews, listening back to it, I always stumble across something that I didn't hear the first time, yeah. uh, even though I was there. I, yeah. I hear somebody go, oh, I didn't, I guess I didn't hear that. I didn't pay attention enough to that the first time around. That's fascinating on the second listen. So, well, I'm, I'm glad you're getting something out of it. Yeah, more than that. Anyway, thanks everybody for listening, for subscribing, for leaving uh, comments. If you can, we will be back uh, with our next episode, which will be, what will it be? 304. Epi no, I'm sorry. No, no. We'll be back with episode 204. Do I have to keep track now? Is that I what think you might have to. Episode 204, chapter four of The Bullet Catch, and a really fun, interesting, kind of grim chat with Joshua J about tragic magic. We'll see you next time, folks. Take care, everybody. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham. Produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.